Okay, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the final session of the day. Um, today, or this afternoon session is about Ruddy 23. I did ask the, the ladies earlier, should I try and say 23 Osgelga? And to my relief, they told me no, I'll, I'll, I'll stick with the English. Uh, so we're going to be talking about um, Ruddy 23, an online course to upskill the 21st century librarian. Um, my experience in, in libraries and, and my experience within the profession certainly has, has given me much pride uh, within the profession in terms of I think we're very good at uh, supporting one another in our own professional development and collaborating in that and I think this is a, a wonderful example of that and I'm really looking forward to, to this presentation. Uh, the three presenters that we have here today are, are wonderful proponents of that kind of collaboration and uh, we're, we're going to I think have a, a great talk. So our presenters come all the way from Galway a little shout out to the West there. Uh, so we have Neva Donovan, who is the found, um, who is sorry, the course coordinator of, of Ruddy 23. She's library assistant with Galway County Libraries, treasurer of the Western Regional Section of the LAI, and a founding member of Literacy for All European Library Network. Stephanie Stephanie Rohn is the librarian at the Marine Institute. So um, I must be asking her later some very interesting questions. Um, she's secretary of the Western Regional Section, founding member of Repository Art Network Ireland and a collaborator on Ruddy 23. Caroline is the health librarian with St. Michael's Hospital and communications officer with the Health Sciences Group. And she uh, also is a collaborator on HERE, which is the Health Evidence Awareness Report, and HINT, which is the Health Information News and Thinking Newsletter. Um, so today, I'll, I'll, I'll just may as well let you get started. Um, and uh, here we go. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much. Hello, everyone. I hope you have some energy left for the last session of the day. My name is Niamh, and today myself, Caroline and Stephanie are going to talk to you about our online learning programme, Ruddy 23. I'm going to firstly talk to you a little bit about the setup of the programme um, and managing it, and then Caroline will talk, you, talk to you about the design and content of the programme, and Stephanie will then talk to you about our feedback and learning from it. So Ruddy 23 directly translates as Things 23, and this was our own homegrown Irish 23 Things course. It was delivered by the Western Regional Section of the Library Association of Ireland. It started on 7th of July 2015 and ran for 14 weeks. The course was certified by the Library Association of Ireland, so anyone that did the course received a CPD certificate at the end. And this was a huge boost for us and it gave something really real and tangible for our participants to work towards, so it was great to have that. So for any of you that aren't familiar with uh, 23 Things, I'll just give you a bit of history into what a 23 Things course is. It was originally designed by Helene Blowers in 2006 uh, called Learning 2.0, and it was for uh, the staff of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Library in the US. Um, so a 23 Things course is a method of teaching a large number of people over multiple locations core competencies in web technology. The basic structure of a 23 Things course is that it usually consists of 23 modules. These modules are delivered at regular intervals via the internet. The course participants are asked to read a short blog post and complete some simple tasks and then write their own reflective blog post based on their learning from completing those tasks. So. Um, <clears throat> Uh, the core, a core element to this kind of uh, format of a course is um, self-discovery. So the learners are asked to use their own skills for learning and then to, to um, employ what they've learned in their own workplace and in their, in their own lives. And we believe that this is one of the real reasons why this course has been such a success. Um, we know that it has been replicated at least 700 times worldwide since 2006 and we suspect it's probably more than that. I think it's safe to say that there is a 23 Things course running somewhere at any given time across the world. So why did we run a 23 Things programme? Well, I gave a presentation in 2014 for the Western Regional Section seminar based on a 23 Things course that I did um, and about how much it benefited me. 
And we received a lot of uh, positive feedback as a result of that presentation. And a lot of people expressed an interest in doing a 23 Things course, or should we ever run one? And um, I was surprised by that because I kind of thought, oh, you know, the 23 Things ship maybe has sailed, but um, I was incorrect. And when you look at uh, documents such as the Public Libraries um, Strategy Opportunities for All and the Public Sector Core Competency Framework, they all cite a need to uh, train library staff to upskill in new technology and web technology. Unfortunately, with our financial circumstances these days and with um, less staff and financial constraints on libraries, it's very hard to do that. So a 23 Things course is an ideal way to achieve this. It has very little uh, financial input, it's very adaptable, and it has very easily achievable outcomes with long-term benefits. So, well, with what the course lacks in financial input, it certainly makes up for in terms of work and effort. And our Water 23 programme wouldn't have been possible without the team, which you can see here. There was 11 of us in total, some of you are in the audience. Uh, 10 library professionals and one educator with an interest in technology-enhanced learning. My role in the programme was as the manager and course coordinator, so I was primarily involved in the setup of the course. And uh, Thankfully, we had the template already in place from uh, Helene Blowers and also from the course that I did with the Cambridge University Library. So what I was more concerned with was developing the Ruddy 23 brand or package, so to speak. So that meant developing things like logos, images, information about the course, um, welcome messages on all our networks. We wanted to have an already established presence on as many of the networks as possible when we started advertising the course. So we set up a Twitter page, a Pinterest page, a Google Plus community, the Ruddy23 blog itself, a Facebook group and a LinkedIn group. So the Ruddy23 blog was our main point of contact for any information about the course. We had um, all the information about who we were, what the course was about. We tried to anticipate as many frequently asked questions as possible for our participants. We gave helpful hints on things like password management. We had links to all of our networks on the blog as well. And as the course progressed, we also had uh, links to all of the participants' blogs themselves. So any time a participant published a new blog post, a link would appear on our, on our website as well. And this resource is still here, it's still on, online, and it's available if you ever want to take a look. If any of you are interested in doing a 23 Things course on your own or with your institution, I'd encourage you to take a look. Um, so that was the foreground preparations. There was a lot of background preparation required as well. Uh, firstly, we had to have a social media policy. There was 11 of us in the group, all simultaneously tweeting and writing and sharing and blogging about this Ruddy23. So it was important that everyone was on the same page in terms of uh, the purpose of all the different tools we were using, comments, policies, etc. I also had to write a content guide for anyone that was writing our modules so that all of the modules had the same difficulty level, same kind of length, and that the tone of it was consistent throughout. We also had a moderator guide, because all of our team also moderated any of the participants' blogs. So it was just a, a bit of a guide in terms of how much input to give into the comments, and also how to manage the volume of blog posts that each moderator would be reading. And lastly, a group admin guide. So for any of the team that were administrating our groups, like the Facebook group and the LinkedIn group, advice on how to engage the participants in the groups, generate discussion, and welcome new members. So my role as manager for this project was certainly a unique one. Our team, because we were so widely spread over Ireland, has yet to all be in the same room together at the same time. Um, so this project was managed wholly virtually online. We used Google Groups to discuss and plan the course throughout, and that proved very effective. But I also had to keep in mind that because we had never met, we, do, we needed to generate our own team core element as well in that group. So we, I had to put a bit of work into generating a bit of discussion amongst the group, encouraging everyone to introduce themselves. I also had to be aware of the fact that while I was always, always on the networks looking at the kind of feedback we were getting, from Twitter and from LinkedIn, etc. Not everyone else on the team might be as, um, as active as me, so I was giving regular updates 
in terms of the type of feedback we were getting, the kind of stats we were getting on our blog, just so that everyone knew what kind of progress we were making and that everyone felt invested in the project. What we did find, however, because it was completely virtually run, that there were some challenges. While it was very easy to communicate with the team via email and via messaging on a group, not everyone would read the emails or the messages thoroughly. Sometimes information would get lost. And what I would say that it, it does help if you can meet in person at least once or twice throughout a project if you're doing something similar. And lastly, I just wanted to say something about library advocacy. We introduced adv advocacy for libraries as a module in the course, but uh, in reality, it was an ongoing theme throughout the course. Every tool that we introduced throughout the course, we demonstrated how it could be used to advocate for the profession and for, for yourself and your library. Um, and it was our intention in introducing these tools and, into, and getting these people active online that they would um, become more aware of the already vibrant and active network of library professionals that exist online and the support that's there and how so many people are already shouting about libraries online. And we're hopeful that the, some of the people that have done the course will remain online now and will keep blogging and tweeting and sharing and talking about libraries and hopefully help us to get that little bit louder and smash those stereotypes that sometimes we fall victim to. And now I'm going to hand you over to Caroline. Thanks, Neve. So, um, as Neve has mentioned, the design of Ruddy 23 was based on the 23 Things template, which meant effectively that we had to come up with 23 different modules for our participants. So, early in May 2015, a proposed list of topics was circulated to the Ruddy 23 team, and we were each invited to pick a topic or multiple topics that were of interest to us. And we also had the option then to select alternative topics if there was something we were particularly invested in and wanted to research and write about. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. So each of the items or each of the topics had a due date pre-assigned to it. And that was important because each of the modules, we needed to be able to deliver them in terms of our own work and social schedule. Because Ruddy 23 is a voluntary project, a lot of us were contributing our time and expertise outside of our working day. So behind me, you'll see some of the different module types. Um, they could essentially be broken into two different types. We had the informational modules, which were things, for example, like um, attending conferences, advocacy, networking, and so on and the technical modules, which were dealing with the use of software and apps. Now, the post, the, each module was approximately 1,000 words long, so about five to 10 minutes reading time. We broke them up using images and instructional videos. Um, there were multiple reasons for that. Obviously, you don't want to be reading a big chunk of text, it's boring. Um, but also because we wanted images that we could use to link out when we were sending out tweets. We wanted to an image to go with the link to the blog post because we all know that images increase your hit rate on Twitter. We also want to be able to pin them on our Pinterest board. Now, as Neve has mentioned, the participants had to complete a blog post at the end of each module. For the technical modules, this usually consisted of use one of the tools, write about your experience of using it. For the informational modules, it was more along the lines of, OK, reflect on what you've learned in this particular module. We also had a few more structured guidelines around creating the technical modules. So they had to cover at least two web-based tools. They would provide a brief introduction to the tool, how you would register, how you'd download if that was appropriate, um, how to get set up and started what you were going to use the tool for, and how it could be used in libraries. Now, we were keen to make sure that the tools would be free web-based tools. We didn't want our participants to have to pay for things, but also we're conscious that most libraries are working on a budget, and we wanted to work within that. In terms of the participant blog posts, um, there was a big variety in what we saw coming through. Some of our participants wrote very short blog posts, and it was quite difficult to actually tell how much they had engaged with the tools. 
Other participants wrote fantastically detailed reflective posts. They really took the opportunity to write about what they were learning, how they were going to be able to implement it. They also did things like link into previous projects they've worked on, or maybe talk about projects they were working on currently. So in other words, what they were doing was not just blogging about the course, but using it as a way to promote themselves to their current employers and to their future employers. Now we did actually later on in the course offer a module on reflective practice, looking at things like Gibbs Reflective Cycle, and we invited our participants to go back and maybe make edits to a post they'd written previously, and that did help improve the quality of some of the participant blog posts. Now, as you can imagine, it takes a good bit of time to create a module. So you have the basic research that has to be done. There's also writing, rewriting, editing, re-editing. But you also have to consider things like sourcing the images that you're going to use, making sure that they're either public domain or that they're available for use, and testing your links and tools, making sure that when you have your final blog post ready to go and the module has been created that everything is actually going to function as you expect it to. In addition to writing the modules, each of the team members were also invited to moderate participant blog posts. So by moderation we mean that they would review and comment on an individual's blog posts and that was the way to encourage our participants to let them know that someone was actually reading their work um, and we saw that as contributing to the completion rate for the course. It was also a way for us to give feedback and encourage some of our shorter writing participants to maybe expand on what they'd written. Now, the team obviously had a lot of roles to fulfill. There was writing the modules, moderating the participant blog posts, but there were also, as Neve has previously mentioned, moderating the Ruddy, Twe Ruddy 23 accounts. So Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and so on. And there were the administrative tasks. So things like managing technical difficulties, um, the updating the delicious feed, the Google Plus account, and so on. And as Neve has also mentioned, we have still actually never all met in a room. So um, we had an interesting experience where one of our team members came up to us just there and we were like, oh, that's what you look like. Um, <laughs> so we did have the opportunity to use tools. Um, some collaborative tools work great. Email was essential because a lot of us work in organizations where the firewalls block the collaborative tools we'd like to use. But Google Hangouts was great, um, obviously Facebook and other things, Twitter. And using those tools as a team meant that we could then include them in the course. We could use them with participants. So we had a Twitter chat, which was hosted by Siobhan. Um, we had a Google Hangout live on air and encouraged our participants to engage in that. We have an active Facebook page, and all of these things helped bring the participants' learning from theoretical to experiential. So they actually got to see things working real time in a live environment, and that helped to build a sense of community. But we really knew that we were onto something with Ruddy23 when some of our participants actually contacted us and said, can we please have a badge or a logo or something to put on our blogs, on our Twitter feed, to let people know that we're taking part in this course? And that was really fantastic for us because it meant not only did they value it for themselves, but they wanted to give a shout out and let other people know that they were doing it. And it was a really nice precursor to the feedback that we asked for at the end of the course. And now Stephanie is going to talk about that. So it's left to me to ask the question, well, was it worth all the effort? And yes, it was. <laughs> I'll give away the ending. Um, in order to evaluate the success rate of Ruddy23, we can compare it to other MOOCs or massive open online courses. And in a study on trends and completion rates in MOOCs, um, Cathy Jordan discovered that on average, uh, the completion rates for MOOCs is less than 10%. For Ruddy23, our completion rate was 36.7%. Now this completion rate is based on enrolments, so that we can directly um, compare it to Jordan's figure. However, if we actually look at the completion rate of the participants who actively blogged, and by that we mean they physically wrote something in their blog, so they participated in the course, that completion rate actually rises to 55.2%. 
And we believe the success of Ruddy 23 is based on the fact that each of our participants had um, a moderator assigned to them and due to the interactive nature of the course itself. So just a bit more on the participants. We had 235 people fill in our online registration form. Of those, 185 participants actually um, set up a, uh, a Ruddy 23 blog. However, only 123 of those physically wrote something in the blog. So this is the figure we based our 55.2% on. Of those, 79 people thought they would complete the course, so they applied for an LAI certificate. And, wait for it, 68 people completed Ruddy 23. So we're absolutely thrilled with that figure. Our participants were diverse. Ruddy had a greater reach than we even could imagine. 58.6% uh, of our participants came from Ireland and 37.8% of our participants came from the UK. And yes, your geography is not deceiving you. We did have participants from places like Ghana, Trinidad and Tobago, Ecuador, Malaysia, Australia, and they were actively blogging from these places. Um, but that wasn't all. Um, to really evaluate the reach Ruddy23 had, we looked at the Google, statistic, Google blogger statistics, and we found, not surprisingly, 39% of our readership came from Ireland. But what did surprise us was that 24% of our readers came from the United States. And we actually only had one blogger actively participating in Ruddy23 from the USA. So this really shows to us the value of having these courses online and open to everyone. It's not just the people who are enrolled in the course and who are actively blogging, but the courses do have value for the greater audience and that global library community may have mentioned. So who are these, who are the audience? The academic public and school libraries are the main sector that we're interested in completing Ruddy 23. So if you are interested in running your own 23 Things course, this is the cohort of people that we recommend you look at. So at the end of the course, we did ask participants to fill out a simple 10 question survey. This was just to evaluate the course. The survey is still available online because the deadline just ended two weeks ago, so the data is a bit of a work in progress. So we asked participants, what tools did they really engage with or enjoy using to participate with each other? And overwhelmingly, Twitter was the most popular. I think that's a trend today. Everybody's mentioning Twitter and how successful it is for them. After that, Facebook and blogging were the popular tools. And following that, Google Plus and email. We, we felt that p the participants didn't need to communicate with each other through email because they were tweeting and they were, po they were posting comments on each other's blogs. So it, was, it wasn't necessary. Then we asked participants, are they likely to keep using these tools outside of Ruddy23? They've learned how to use them, they've engaged with them. Are they going to use them in their daily lives? And again, overwhelmingly, 93% of our participants said yes, they would continue to use Twitter. And surprisingly for me anyway, 81% uh, said they would like to continue using Facebook groups. So any reservations you may have about being on Facebook, it is worthwhile having a Facebook group for your course or for your organization or for any online campaign that you are running. LinkedIn, 72% of our participants are there. Google Hangouts actually gained in popularity with 39% and less so with um, Google+. So if you do want to contact librarians, we're all hanging out on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Alison might be aghast, but we're, we're all there. We're using those tools. And then we asked participants, well, what modules really had them jumping for joy? What did they enjoy the most? And learning new technologies was up there. They really enjoyed new technologies and blogging about those new technologies. They enjoyed writing about how they got on with the new tools. Not so much about reading each other's blogs. They, they ranked that lower. So this kind of tells us that we, they were using Ruddy23 for a personal upskilling rather than a community engagement. On the flip side of that, we asked them what did they not like about the course, and they said technical difficulties and time management. But these were largely out of our control. We did at the start in the frequently asked section of the blog um, stage the hardware and software requirements for completing Ruddy23. And we also suggested a ballpark figure of about an hour to spend on each tool and maybe then you know, a bit more time writing up the reflective practice. But we did listen to our participants and we offered a deadline extension. So while the initial course ran for 14 weeks, the participants did have six months to complete it. Then we asked the participants to rate their top three modules. Now, out of our 23 modules, 18 of them kept appearing in the top three for the participants. So this told us that all of the modules had value to the participants. But the ones that we saw most frequently were video, blogging, and augmented reality, which is quite interesting. Augmented reality, participants kept saying that they really enjoyed this module. However, when we asked them which of the 
modules they were never going to use again, they also said augmented reality. <laughs> we kind of drew from this that maybe participants just couldn't see a use case for it in their library. So if you really want to impress the socks off your colleagues, you know, start an augmented reality campaign in your library today. And finally on this, we just asked participants, where are they going to use their Ruddy 23 LAI certificate for greater CPD purposes? And a whopping 66% said yes, they were, and they were going to use it for their ALAI certificates or their SILUP chartership or certificates again. And incidentally, all of us on the Ruddy 23 team are going to go for our LA ALAI this year, so it's going to be a bumper year, we hope. And we encourage all participants of Ruddy 23 to just go for it, use this, and use your certificate for today, and go for your associateship. And just a final point to summarise and leave you on, if you are thinking of going down the road and developing your own 23 Things course or any MOOC online, just to ensure that you do keep continuous engagement with your, with your participants and make sure you're on social media, especially Twitter, you can stay away from Google if it's so terrible, and try to space out the modules by leaving about a week between. And from a management point of view, try to keep it as just one or two management uh, collaborative tools and you know, try to meet at least once face to face, but if you can't, it still works. Thank you. And we'll take any questions now or in the bar. Thanks very much. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, don't kill me for this, but the obvious question, are you going to run it again? <laughs> uh, can you hear me? You're not the first person to ask us that question. <laughs> um, we have discussed it, and um, what we have said is the current course will remain available on the website for the foreseeable future. Um, possibly we will do it again in a couple of years time when the tools have changed there might be new technology out there worth looking at or exploring but at the moment no we're looking forward to a nice holiday Hi, well done girls. Um, actually, I kind of like to see the two sides of every story, so I was just wondering, you named the three most popular, so what was the least popular module? Well, the 18 other modules did keep ranking on the most popular, so there was, no, there, was no outstanding, there was no outstanding module that they said they didn't like. They really liked everything. We're just brilliant. <laughs> That's the kind of uh, smashing stereotypes we like. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I think a bullet bus. <laughs> okay. Leisha's running up here, so that makes me kind of scared. Um, <laughs> oh, yes, 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 yes. Okay. <sighs> So, okay, so we have a few little bits and pieces to get through before we can uh, move on to the looking at the poster exhibition again. First of all, we have a uh, raffle for a book donated from Facet Publishing. So it's uh, social media for creative libraries. And I have, this is my actual hat that I wore today. Um, didn't intend for it to be used like this, but um, Neil, I'll get you. Okay, and the winner is Ruth O'Flaherty. Okay, so what's next? Um, just a few, well, one important notice about for those of you who are going to be here tomorrow. Um, do try and get here before half nine, between nine and 9.30, to make sure that you have the time to register for your lunch. Otherwise, you might not get fed. So, you know, that's, <coughs> I think that's, that, that'll speak to all of us. Um, so now we're, we're getting close to the time, I suppose, to, to move out into the... Um, most of you have had a chance, I think, to look at the posters. 
But um, so we have a, about a half an hour now to both look at the posters and to move into the uh, exhibition space or the sponsor space in here as well and to get a chance to use those chat up lines on our sponsors, okay? Leisha has, has inspired us all. And to fill out your quiz and drop it into the quiz box outside. The posters again, of course, uh, feel free to ask any of the presenters questions about their posters. I think they should be out there uh, for the next half hour or so. And don't forget to vote for your favorite poster by the end of, I think about lunchtime tomorrow, uh, those, those votes need to be in. Um, and then lastly, the important bit, okay, well, it's all important, but you know, I think we are all looking forward to a glass of wine, uh, which will be out in the front bar, the shore bar, from about 5.30. Okay, and thank you very much. I hope you had a great day. Thank you.